Hello, hello, hello. I am Janae Osterhill, Boston Globe Culture Columnist. Thank you for being here with us today in this lovely conversation on the intersection of arts and justice. Um, I want to introduce our illustrious guest today, um, Harold Stewart, Executive Director and Cultural Strategist of Theater Offensive. Catherine T. Morris, Executive Director of Boston Art and Music Soul Fest, as well as um, Programs Director for the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, the marvelous Makiba McQuarrie, Chief of Learning and Community Engagement of Museum of Fine Arts, as and Che Anderson, Assistant Vice Chancellor for City and Community Relations at UMass Med School, and a recently appointed member of the Mass Cultural Council. Hello, everyone. So today we're here to really sit at that intersection of arts and justice. And I wanna start us off by sharing a quote by James Baldwin from The Creative Process. The precise role of the artist is to eliminate that darkness, blaze roads through that vast forest so that we will not in all our doing lose sight of its purpose, which is after all to make the world a more human dwelling place. So I wanna start with you, Harold, and just have each of you sort of say what the role of art is to you, what it is, what that role in society is to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Janae, for the invitation. And it's an honor to be here with such distinguished guests. Um, I think to me, because art has been a part of my life, my mother would say I came out in a very dramatic way. So it's no surprise that I'm a theater practitioner. But I think um, when you think about society, I want to think about culture. What is the role of art in any kind of like cultural society? And what do the artists do in terms of like storytelling? Um, entertainment, um, really amplifying the metaphor and helping us visualize um, the past, the present, and the future. Um, so for me, it is that kind of unique role that get us out of this kind of empirical way of thinking and more um, beautiful, abstract, um, and sustaining like the beautiful aesthetics of one's culture. Catherine? Sure. I'm like, who, who's going to call on who? Um, <laughs> thank you, Janae, also for having us. It's great to see all of my lovely melanated leaders who I love so much. Um, for me, um, the role of the arts is, is really about connecting humanity. It, it centers us on not forgetting uh, what brings us together. And that is our, our humanity, our, our connectedness, our ability to communicate in a variety of different ways to share and lived experiences and also to address challenges um, that aren't necessarily always the easiest to say what words, but you can say it through other means and platforms um, and other artistic expressions. And it, to me, is like this, the role of the arts is really like this um, low barrier or low, uh, low barrier to actually having hard conversation because it could be a color choice. It could be the way that um, an image is projected or even where it's located that can actually spark very interesting conversations with likely and unlikely people who may never see each other except for that one moment. So the arts really is about, you know, to Harold's point, like intersectionality, um, but also just this fact that without it, I don't know, I don't know where society would be if, if art wasn't a part of our very fabric. Makiba. Catherine, thank you for the um, melanation quote. I'm not sure I'm quite there right now. I need a little bit more sun, but um, I'm honored to be in that, <laughs> in this in this group with all of you. You know, Janae, more and more, I am convinced that um, that art is, is both political um, in its power, but also um, like really, make sure that there's that bridge to the personal. And when you think about access to other people's stories, you know, artists have a medium, they choose their medium. Um, it might be multiple mediums and they have an opinion. They express their opinion on how they're feeling. They express their opinion on how you make them feel, um, what they're seeing happening in the world at that period in time. And um, they give the viewer a secondary opportunity to um, enter into their own thought process. So when I'm when I'm witnessing um, a theater or I'm witnessing um, 
uh, an object of art or um, listening to music, um, the exchange I think is one of the most powerful ones that can, can happen um, because it gives me a chance to be both in a moment of conflict or um, tension, um, but also release. Um, and I can't really think of anything else that offers human beings um, the chance to, to have that kind of, be in that kind of relationship with one another. <laughs> um, that's Peppermint Patty, who has her own thoughts on art. Last but not least, <laughs> Jay. <laughs> Um, I just want to give a big shout out to Peppermint Patty, who's one of my favorite creatures ever created. Um, I think that coming off of one of the most difficult times um, in our history, um, the last year plus taught us that art is an essential service, that there is no way many of us would have survived without the arts in some capacity. <clears throat> and that art, while people may think the word and have a particular idea or medium in mind, Arts is this all-encompassing thing that means so many different things, so many different people. Um, one, one of my mentors always told me that the best thing you can do is create value where none currently exists. And I think the arts do that better than anything else. So, um, you know, one, I'm excited for this conversation, but two, for anyone that's listening, I hope that you understand that like when you think of those that took last year and found ways to uplift us, a lot of those people were artists. And that is a beautiful thing to consider at the onset of this conversation. Thank you. That's absolutely true. I don't know what any of us would really be doing without art. Art is absolutely what we turn to um, in all moments, um, whether it's our best and brightest moments, our deep and darkest moments. Um, you know, I think what Shay just said about this last year, in particular, you know, everything we went through. I, I keep looking at these institutions, not just arts institutions, but all institutions and just the framework, our government, everything. And it's not like George Floyd was the first person to be murdered by police. It's not like racism just popped up yesterday. This is something that this country was built on. It's literally the framework in which we exist in. Um, yet we saw so many organizations kind of use that as a catalyst to say, oh, we're going to do better. We're going to hire more. We're going to give more money. And arts institutions were included in that. Um, you know, I think about white American theater and um, that statement that the 300 theater artists put out, including Susan Laurie Parks and Lynn Nottage. Um, and the 2018 report by the Mellon Foundation that found among all museum hires between 2014 and 2018, 88% of the people hired for executive and conservative roles were white. Um, like 73% of the staff hired in intellectual leadership roles were white. Um, and it, it, it mimics even in the music industry, like the music at the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative found that only, you know, 20% of over 4,000 executives across the industry were from underrepresented groups. And we just see it again and again play out but then I look at what Catherine and Harold are doing in particular um, in making BAMS Fest and, and leading TTO. And it, I know people don't immediately see the parallel, but there is a parallel between us creating our own spaces and what Nicole Hannah-Jones and ta Coates did this week in the decision to say, hey, we're taking our talents to a HBCU or what, um, Kirby Jean Raymond is doing by saying, you know, thank you for, you know, choosing me to be the first Black American designer to show at, you know, Paris Couture Week. However, I'm showing from Madam C.J. Walker's estate and you can stream it. You know, we own this narrative. Um, can you talk about the importance of who's gatekeeping our truth and our story and expressing the art, like where it lives? And Catherine, Harold, either one of you can go first. And when you're done, just call on the next person and then go on to Makiba and Shay as well. Catherine, you go. I knew that was coming. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, Harold, you go first. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to take it down a little bit. I'm going to take it to Boston because I can only speak from where I'm from. Um, and getting into 
starting this organization, Bands Fest, um, there was this very unconscious process of identifying all the gatekeepers, black and white, didn't matter. And I noticed that in the process of getting blessings, being told, yes, no, you won't, you won't succeed, whatever. <clears throat> um, there was already an inherent assumption about my failure as a black woman, as a young black woman. And that I had to deal with that on top of fighting for and preserving black culture, black art, black creativity, amplifying as much as possible. And what I find is that a lot of the time it's people who have the most information and connections tend to be the ones who gatekeep, you know? And, and if, if I'm not in the same room or at the same table or, or if I don't have certain affiliations or go to a certain church or whatever, I'm not deemed worthy. And then that information starts to get passed around sometimes unbeknownst to someone who's actually trying to make change for their communities, that makes it really, really hard and difficult to press on every single day. But I believe in the notion that Boston can change. It's changing, you know, whether people like it or not, this, this train is moving fast. And, you know, for folks like myself and Harold, um, I think, you know, and not to be disrespectful, but I think we've pretty much just given a middle finger to a lot of gatekeepers. Um, you, you know, and it's not even, it's not being disrespectful. It's just like, you have your lane, I have mine. I see a vision. I'm going to execute on that vision because either this group of people or a whole, you know, a whole city or a whole neighborhood is not being served. And at this juncture and in, in this historic time, I'm here to make a mark and plant the seed of the vision and watch the community help mold it into what it could be. I leave with that, Harold. <laughs> so bring me in. So was my cue the middle finger, Catherine? That's what I'm trying to do. That's what I pick up on. Um, so I think I want to go back just for a second and talk about what I think of as Freedom Summer 2022, right? Whether it's George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, a combination of all of that energy and time but also connected to a global pandemic um, when folks were in isolation. So I think it's the one moment in my lifetime where everybody um, experienced the same threat and no safety for them. We're also watching the global economy kind of do its thing. Um, and what I know about people who are in the dominant culture and power, um, typically um, white people, um, what gets their attention is fear and, and and capitalism and money, right? So I think when we're looking at what shifted, um, we couldn't go nowhere. <laughs> um, the markets, the money markets were in flux. Um, and there was this shared threat for everybody's life and humanity, right? Which, again, I think um, kind of opened the eyes. And at the same time, you have a group of frustrated people who've been frustrated for a long time and are risking, risking their lives through it all. So in addition to this threat of a pandemic, you have this really organized movement, um, whether you connect it to the movement for Black Lives or the movements before and every movement before that. So it was a real moment, I think, that shook. I can talk about what I experienced in this country, but I really think the world, right? So George Floyd was um, key to that, but there's so much work that happened before um, and so much like connectivity and organizing that were poor people of color and a lot of poor black women who put their lives um, at the forefront of this movement without um, a promise of a payoff or that we would get here so soon, but they just believed in it. So I think that's important. Um, and what the cultural sector did <laughs> was kind of gold jack that movement, right? Um, and we had to have conversations around, you know, the movement for Black Lives is very specific about what their asks are and who they're asking. And we can't just gold jack and we haven't really invested in that movement, right? And just see if it's applicable to the cultural sector when there was folks like um, um, Dr. Marta, uh, Marta Marino Vega, who founded the Caribbean Cultural Center and gave us a cultural equity movement in our field that largely got ignored because she was a woman of color, right? And then we exchanged that for diversity and, and um, what is it called? Yeah, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? So I think when we think about 
um, this conversation is like, what's uniquely arts and culture and who have been at the forefront of this work in our movement? And it has been people of color, it has been women. And why didn't we listen to them? And now that we were all experiencing this enormous threat on so many fronts, all of a sudden, you know, we want to read, we want to listen, we want to take time. But again, to get the attention of folks in this country, it really is about the dollar. When the dollar is in jeopardy, when you can't sustain yourself, um, people listen. So that's on that. I think in terms of gatekeepers, um, it's just really interesting. I think, you know, we've made the production of art so expensive. We made the systems to produce it. So, you know, there are gatekeepers when Again, I led with culture because I think these are cultural practices that we are continuing to sustain um, and grow, and it shouldn't come at the cost that we have to like hustle to kind of fundraise. So really, when we made arts a business is when we start getting different types of, of gatekeepers. And for the theater offensive, you know, we're unique. We're queer and trans people of color theater. So what I say is that, well, if you have someone in your portfolio, if I'm talking to foundations that already is doing this work, um, then that's one thing because foundations, if we look at institutional funding, also have like missions and values and things like that. So I try to engage the gatekeepers around what they say um, they want to do and who they say they are. And again, if there's a theater offensive type in there, that's wonderful, but um, a lot of times there's not. So it is a strategic opportunity for some gatekeepers to live up to who they say that they are. Um, and some we take that journey and some we don't. Um, and I'll call on Makiba. I've been, um, I've had Nicole Hannah Jones in my brain for the past 24 hours. She's been talking to me very personally. Um, and she, she sort of is informing my response to you, Janae, um, in some ways, but I also think something I've been thinking a lot about as of late, which is, um, you know, when you have a gatekeeper, it means that you've assigned power to them and you've, you've said that they're, hold, they're keeping you from something, right? Like there's something behind that door that you some, uh, somehow have no other way to get to it other than through them or through that, that, um, that barrier. Um, but I mean, I wonder if, if you sort of deconstructed that and said, okay, actually, what if what's behind that barrier is A, not the most valuable thing in the world or b what if i actually already have access to the beauty the value the narrative all of those stories um myself like uh, you know um, i'm trying to get into this world figuratively and and literally here you know even at the museum right that somehow this this institution holds all of these incredible stories that are encyclopedic in nature but when i go out of this building and walk across the street to you know rob's mural or Vic's mural or, or, you know, other, other institutions in the city that, or I go to, a, you know, something that Harold is putting on, or I go to a BAMS festival, like we do that. Like we did that. Nobody, nobody stood in front of it. Nobody told us, you know, you can or cannot come in. So I would venture to say that we are probably our worst gatekeepers. Um, you know, we get in our way and she's, Nicole is, is sort of called, I think, many of us on the carpet, myself included, to say, and not, I don't think in, a, in an aggressive sort of like shaming way, but, but as a highlight to say, okay, do we continue to invest in white institutions and say, let us in, let us in, let us in, or do we turn around and take our incredible grace and value and um, um, power and invest in ourselves? And then Catherine and Harold don't have to keep going to these foundations, asking them for money and trying to convince them that this is the thing they should invest in. You know, there I solved it all. <laughs> Shay. The problem with going last on these things is y'all give me so much to think about. I feel like I have to respond now to everything. It's like, it's, it's a tough position to be in. Um, from, there's something that, that Hal said that really sort of struck me around uh, DEI work and sort of re, rebranding, retooling something and everyone now being super invested in it. Um, and what strikes me the most is that um, why that term has to be what it is, right? Because like each level was enough, right? We talked about diversity work for a long time and then we realized like, well, not all diversity is equitable and not all equity is inclusive. Um, and then now we're talking about accessibility and, and what does access mean um, and access to what and access to whom. And um, to, to keep it very much about us as a people, 
um, and uh, Nikki, we touched on this recently when we had a conversation about how when you look at what's considered black culture, um, at this point, it is probably the highest grossing culture we have as a global population, right? Whether it's the music or the fashion or anything, the food, like all, all of it, right? Like it is, it is the thing everyone wants to have a piece of, and yet smaller organizations struggle to become larger organizations or find the funding needed, right? To, to do what they have to do. Um, and so when, when our culture has become commodified to a point that like our people can't even get the things they need, but everybody wants a piece of it or try to do a spinoff of it, at some point we have to have a conversation. And, and this is a conversation by all means, right? But like, we need to have another conversation that's not being recorded amongst us about what happened and sort of how do we, how do we fix that? So I think Makiba's point is well taken. And I think what, you know, what's been done with things like Vance Fest or other sort of you know, efforts around the, the state or around the country have been, have been great, but we still need to have that larger conversation around how do we create more opportunities um, for ourselves quite candidly. Um, and I don't think it's a matter of necessarily just, you know, shunning institutions that may be predominantly white or that have the funding, but there needs to be a very real way to express like, there are systems in place why you have said funding. And we're not just gonna come and like, put our hand down and be like, hey, give us stuff. That's cool if you don't wanna do that. But we have all of this cultural equity that, that we've built, that's ours. And we're gonna have to do something else with it if you're not willing to come to the table with as much as we're bringing. Because the funding is nice, but if we take all this culture away, well, then you have nothing to fund, right? There's no one that's going to sort of play ball with you. Um, and how that conversation comes to be, that, that's, you know, that's sort of the secret sauce that we got to figure out. Again, not on camera, like maybe over a coffee or drink or something, but we'll figure that out. Um, and, and so when it comes to gatekeepers, I, I love the point that like, by assigning that term to someone, you're then saying that they have access to something with, and not acknowledging the thing you have access to, right? maybe there's an opportunity for us to be more gatekeeper with the things that we hold near and dear that other people value until we can come to a table as equals and discuss what we each are bringing to this deal. Thank you. I'm a believer of, of many things can be true at once and the, re the revolution requires many tools. So I wholeheartedly believe like we need our own um, spaces, protected spaces that are ours, our own things and frameworks that we build, but we also need people in the institution dismantling it while we have it. Kind of like Shagun is always talking about, like we need the diggers and the builders. We need everybody to kind of be um, playing in the various fields, inside ball and outside. Um, one of the reasons why I brought Nicole Hannah Jones and and Kirby Jean Raymond, who I don't I don't think we talk enough about him, and kind of how he has bent these institutions to him. He does not bend to them, and um, how he brings them into the hood and into black spaces. and And even if he works with a corporation like Reebok, he bends them to his aesthetic. Um, and it just I don't know. It just makes me want to love on all of you and just say, hey, keep doing what you're doing in all of the various rooms each of you walk in. And Che, you're not gonna go last this time. You're actually gonna go first. I'm gonna start with Che and Makiva. Um, we had a number of questions submitted before the panel from various uh, audience members and several of the questions mimicked each other and they were all around hiring and board members. Um, at these institutions. And since both of you, like Che, I feel like is always being asked to be on somebody's board or to consult or, you know, be somebody's planner of a, a mural festival. And, you know, Makiba, when you got hired, it was really historic and a very a big thing in the community for all of us. So, you know, there's, it's a two part, the, the recurring questions, one is how can organizations, um, be more mindful and intentional about recruiting uh, board members of color and not just recruiting them, but making sure they have space to be heard because sometimes people get added to stuff for optics and then they're not given any room to actually participate. So Che, I want you to take that one. And then Makiba, for you, it's like, what does it mean to be fully inclusive um, 
as an institution and be someone in the institution also trying to experience that because sometimes people bring you on thinking, bring people of color on and then they just assign them all the mess. Um, and you can talk about this or not talk about this, but I, I often think about what happened with the students at the MFA and how it felt to me, how it was just sort of a slump, like everyone sort of gravitated to you to fix it. And I was like, and not just, I'm not talking about inside Ball at the Museum, but like the, the, the community, the society, everybody was like, Makiba, Makiba. And I, in my heart, I just was like, I want to go hug Makiba now because this ain't her mess to clean up. And it's actually not even part of her job. So not that you have to comment on that, but just what it means to be in these spaces and you know be the thing that people are, are considering the solution. And with that, Che, kick it off. Um. I, I will say I, I have been, I think, privileged to be asked to, to join a bunch of things. And so I think first and foremost, like, I'm very appreciative of that, right? Like, I don't take that lightly um, because it, it means that someone, you know, said the right thing or like paid someone 20 bucks or whatever, like whatever the case may be. Like, I feel like that's, it's great to be in that conversation. Um, one thing that I've, I've learned as I've grown and, and sort of been in some of these circles is that it is imperative that when you join a group and you are part of any marginalized group there, that you bring your full self to that group. Um, and I, I think when I first started getting on boards, like I was just happy to be there, right? Like I was a little younger and I was just like, oh man, this is really cool. Like I'm, I'm part of something. And I would sort of sit silently and sort of wait for a moment where I felt like I knew exactly what was going on. Like I was afraid to make mistakes. And I think that part of that is that being a young black male in many of the spaces where there aren't many young people or black men, or you know, to be quite candid, or black woman for that matter. Um, I was just like, I don't want to say the wrong thing sometimes, and then like I'm, I'm losing the seat for us. Like I have to be here so we can know what's going on. I go back to the community and talk about this. And as time went, I realized that doing that, I was doing a disservice um, beyond them even allowing me in sort of said room. Like I, I was not doing the right job. Um, and so it became important for me to express that one, I don't represent all black, um, but two that while I'm here, there are certain experiences that I had that like hopefully allow us to move that needle a little further along where it should be, right? It's also important for me to make sure that if I ever join a board and committee and I'm the only black person on said committee, by the time that my term is over, I am no longer the only black person that committee. Because if I am, I've, I've done a disservice to our people. Um, and, and so I think that those things that, that I've learned, for the institutions, I think that one of the things is important to, to remember is that even if you have a brand new DEIA plan, and you have the best of intentions, right? That plan is a working plan. It is a living document, right? Things change, times change, not every person is the same. And so you have to be willing to understand that like, it doesn't matter what consultant you have and you've paid, if you have a person of color in that room, in that seat, and they say, this is not working, you have to respond to that. You can't just say, well, we've paid all this money for this thing. It's best practice. Like, no, no, that's not necessarily always how it works. And so you have to be willing to have those conversations, which is extra work. And I get that, um, but you're going to be that much better for it. I also think that it is imperative that when you're inviting people, you understand they are going to bring their own selves, whatever that may mean. And so, you know, like I, I was very intentional about my background here today, right? This is even that thing, but like, I love graffiti. Like, I think it's interesting. I think it's beautiful. I think it's something that gets a bad rep. So quite often when I'm on art calls, like, this is it. I want you to know that I like it. I'm not going to switch that up and be all like, no, I'm going to have this beautiful Renaissance painting. I'm not. That's not me. Um, and like, this is a whole subculture and population that I, I try to represent when I'm when I'm there, right? because they deserve to hold space in the same way. In that same vein, you know, when things are coming up, I don't just want to have conversations about like black things when it's time for those conversations. Right. And I think boards understand that we're not just going to talk about black things in February or like on Juneteenth and then go like, well, now we're on to this other thing. For the book. Like, nope, we're going to talk about that all the time it's all encompassing it's something i live constantly <laughs> sorry i just read it amazing um and so i, I want to make sure that i can that i can represent that um i'm not gonna do that yet i'm gonna wait to the chat comment um but yeah Makiba, i'm gonna pass it over to you um i'm gonna just tag a little bit onto your question, but I will answer the other part of the question, Janae, um, of course. You know, I, um, my advice to organizations that think that they wanna, you know, diversify their, their governing boards or their staff or their executive leadership um, is um, don't do it one person at a time. 
And, and I, I made a decision a couple of years ago that I, I actually will no longer accept a board rule um, if I'm the only person. So I've said to plenty of organizations, hey, I am maxed out anyway, but if I said yes, it would be because you actually cleared a slate of three openings and we all come on together. So my charge back to all of us is consider not accepting opportunities where you are the only one. Um, you have a lot of power. We are very necessary. Our voices and our perspectives are critical from both a business proposition for many of these institutions, um, but also from um, just a, 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 a cultural moray perspective, right? Like they, um, they, they need to stop trying to, to um, tinker with the idea of diversity, equity, inclusion, and we need to stop allowing them to do that with us, with our valuable time, our incredible hearts and energy, um, and our really big brains. So that would be my my just position on on that. That said, I took this position knowing I was going to be the only one. I eyes wide open. Um, I stepped out in front of the Davis Leadership Academy um, incident, eyes wide open. You know, nobody pushed me out there. Like I. I felt a very, very strong requirement that, um, that there be a public apology, that there be um, an acknowledgement that this is not um, the institution that I joined. Um, and I, I felt a lot of um, rallying support around that, um, not necessarily a lot of um, competency on how to ensure that that be true, but definitely um, the, the willingness to perceive ourselves at this museum in a, in a different way, a way where that doesn't happen to young black and brown children. Um, it, it was was present and I would say is ever present. That said, um, what, is it, what does it mean to be in spaces and be the person who's asked to be the solution? I don't have a um, romantic answer. It's, it's really hard. Um, it's exhausting. It, I'll be honest, sometimes I'm not sure if it's more painful um, to acknowledge the lack of support that you get from the black and brown community than what I expect from the white community. Um, and I don't mean that by saying people don't, you know, reach out and say, how you doing girl, are you okay? Um, how can we help? And then they're like gone, you know, like, like because really they know that this is hard too. <laughs> And, and, you know, we all have, we all have a lot of hard work that we are taking on in our own spaces, but um, it's, it's really exhausting. And I would say that none of us can do that for a long period of time for the rest of us. None of us can, can we can get in there, we can um, chip away and in the best ways that we know how, which is what I would say I do. Um, I take my talents and I figure out how to be, um, perpetually annoying to <laughs> the pervasive moments of racism and bias. Um, and, um, and also to be a huge champion when I see somebody actually just attempt to get it right. Like they might not get it right, but like to be the person who sits in the room and says, thank you for asking the question. I know that was really scary. I know that you took a lot of courage and guess what? I don't actually have the answer because I'm I, I'm not the, the um, you know, sayer of all black people or people of color, but you ask the question, good for you. And, um, and again, I'm gonna circle back to Nicole Hannah-Jones because I really do think there's a lot of truth in the notion that, um, that um, you know, it might be time for white people to do their own work, right? Like we, we maybe they just need to have boards that are, that are not diverse with racially diverse. If they wanna take on having a, a perspective, a diversity of thought and a diversity of programming and a diversity of mission. There is so much information out there um, that they can, they can YouTube, they can TED talk, they can read a book, they can talk to each other. They can talk to their kids because I actually will stop talking now. Just say that like, I think the solution, the solution is like my son, these you know, young kids who look at us and they're like, how did you let this happen? Right. How, did, how, did, how did we get here? Um, and I don't know that we've done that in our generation um, sufficiently either. I like to think that every generation 
was the best generation until the next generation came. And the next generation is better than before because the prior one poured a little more. I say that a lot, like, versus looking at the generation before and being like, you let this happen. It's like, actually, we did it. Everything in our capacity to make it possible for you to be this great. Um, because it's always the young people that are leading the shift and the change. And but Janae, don't you think it's important? I, I I totally agree with you and I appreciate that. I think what I'm saying is that they, their level of indignation with us, like I've had the same positioning, right, with, with my parents' generation. Like, what do you mean you let Vietnam happen? And then, but yeah, and they, you know, they they made it possible for me to, you know, go to, to college and to go to, an, a, you know, good schools and to have a great job. But I'm just saying, like, I appreciate the intolerance. Like I actually embrace it, I welcome it because it actually is the thing that I think will push this next, you know, group of of, of citizens forward in a way that will have even more of an emphasis than what we've had, um, oh, and maybe we even have the chance to do it together. Yeah, I don't not appreciate it. Like I'm a troublemaker myself, so I appreciate troublemaking. I'm just saying, I there is a thing that happens when we try to police how older people were like their form of revolution or their form of change or like why they did a particularly within the black community looking at other black people and how they did the thing and i'm just of the thinking of you know we needed malcolm and martin we needed the black panther party and SNCC. we need all types of we need people in the institution dismantling it and people that are like fuck the institution like we need in order for real meaningful change i feel like we need all of the things um but that's just how i feel but to you, what I wanted to say before I got sidetracked into that is just thank you. Like as, as a black woman who is in a predominantly white space in a predominantly white industry, I know that pain and exhaustion and hardship. And it is why I keep bringing up Nicole Anna Jones because I, I know what it that weight is. And, um, you know, I look at Shikari and I'm like, yo, I know what it means for all of us to try to be that girl, no matter what your identity or gender orientation is like what the weight the cost of that what i call like the black penalty like what what you pay for entry um so just i'm just lifting you and lifting everybody here who has to carry that um harold i want to just really i had to i had to shift to you because i was about to start crying um <laughs> about just how hard it is for us out here um i I really want to talk about this $3 million gift, this $3 million bag from Mackenzie Scott and Dan Jewett, this $3 million unrestricted gift. Um, can we talk about, when we talk about accountability and money's promise, so much money was promised right. you know, last summer, like all these institutions, like, oh, we're going to give these millions of dollars. Very little money was actually given. Mackenzie Scott is the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Kinsey Scott just makes it rain all over the place philanthropically. Um, but can you talk about what that type of gift and, mm -hmm. and what this type of funding means in when we talk about accountability and what people can do to help Black art and help Black aesthetics? I also mm -hmm. want to give, this, give you room here to talk about um, I don't want anyone to conflate the work that TTO is doing with this money. This money is amazing, but TTO was already under transition. TTO was literally in the middle of rolling out um, Queer Republic and the aesthetics of resistance. So I, I want to make sure Harold has space to talk about that change that was instituted before the money came so people don't conflate it. Ooh, Janae, I just feel like, Lord. You were made like you know everything about all of them. I just want to celebrate you and the amount of details that you know. And I also feel Che now because I'm in this position where so much beautiful things have been shared, and I want to add perspective, but I also want to honor time and what I what has been asked of me. So the one thing I'll say in terms of like board and staff is sometimes we ask how before we ask why, right? So I think if you ask why and sit with those assumptions, whatever they may be, then the how may reveal itself. And in terms of this intergenerational kind of aspects, because for most people like me, Black, queer, growing up in the South, there is this intergenerational responsibility and lineage that I inherited that I was a part of. So I feel you, Makiba. And I'm working on this tool and with this tool around understanding cultural 
kind of geologies that looks at places like where did I land, where am I leading, and where am I led? And just from a pure spot of just like acknowledging, you know, and analyzing those things to help me understand um, the intergenerational aspects of that and the ideologies that continue to shape me. And when it's time for me to kind of step back and be like, okay, niece and nephew, do that thing. I don't want to learn TikTok, but it seems like a revolutionary tool for y'all, right? Um, to the Mackenzie Sky gift, I think there's so much still, you know, because it's such a surprise and it's such um, a transformative gift that every day I think about it. And again, I'm a place, I'm a person of culture. I'm a black boy from the South. So every morning I think about it, I have to thank my grandmother, right? Okay. And her sacrifice, those that are known and those that are unknown. And my whole family's belief in me that, you know, that can make this possible. Like what they told me, how they um, continue to push me forward, you know, um, and things like that. So when a gift like this comes and what I told the representatives that I was able to talk to about this gift when they told us about it, after I like shared one little gangster tour, because you know, I'm not one little gangster tour, I can't give too many of them away, um, is that at the theater offensive, and thank you for lifting up our work, we do have now this queer and trans people of color aesthetic that is revolutionary, that's groundbreaking, that's pushing. And I know, especially uh, living and working in Boston, it would be easier for me to raise money if we were a predominantly gay organization and mindset and engage with um, the gay aesthetic, like the largely white gay aesthetic um, and interests, you know, and then slipped in some of the other stuff that we wanted to do. But we refused to do that because we set out these values two and a half years ago. What that means is that I'm an accountable party for our staff of eight, eight and a half and their livelihood every day, right? Um, and some days that keeps me up at night and I wonder, should I compromise? But like, actually, can you compromise? Like, like what does that kind of look like? And to have such a transformative gift come in and, and what do I say about the theater offensive, especially there's a lot of things that we could do, should be doing, but we ask the question, can we sustain it for three years, right? Um, because as people of color and especially black people, we're used to like a good thing and then it's taken away or we were promised something and it didn't happen. Um, but I wanted to be able to provide some sustainability and consistency for whatever we use this gift for. So we look at it in like the three year mark. Um, but what it has meant, especially coming with no restrictions, them um, identifying us, us not having to court them is that, you know, the work, there is validation on the work. Other things about the Mackenzie Scott gift is that, you know, Mackenzie Scott is obviously someone who understands power because she's, you know, she did what she did for the organizations, but she challenged the other people that are in her position to say, you can do this too, you know, so using her positional power in such a beautiful way that hopefully, you know, people will want to model what she's done. But I think for the theater offensive, we're, I mean, it's moving us to a place where we can think about um, investments and capital gains, right? Um, as well as, you know, and, and people didn't want me to talk about, they encouraged me not to talk about um, benefits to staff because people would think we were just given. And I was like, you know, I, we have staff of color and we have hardworking staff and young staff. So I won't be ashamed to say that in a city like Boston, where they lie and tell you that the cost of living is $37,000, we've increased staff salaries. We've um, invested in their retirement, right? You know, their overall benefits and health and doing things like program enhancements but at the theater offensive, you know, we um, we are all in our head. We do ideation all the time. And a couple of months ago, this idea of queer regeneration, you know, came and we said, you know, how do we sustain this moment? And how do we take gifts like this and make sure they multiply or they cycle in and out? So we've been thinking about this thing around queer regenerations because there is a particular way that queer people do that, right? You know, if we didn't um, find ways to regenerate, we wouldn't still be here. You know, because when you look at the intersections of who's at risk of death on top of death on top of death, you know, queer and trans black and brown people really are miracles, but they're also spirits and you can't kill spirits. Right. You know, you may be able to harm some, but you would never be able to get rid of all of us. So right now we're just thinking about, you know, what does it look like for this gift to regenerate? So we're not dependent upon another $3 million, but we found a way to kind of maximize it. And it celebrates, you know, anyone will tell you, we have a grassroots um, development strategy. 
Um, we have a philosophy that anyone can give and or influence a gift. So I celebrate the three million, like I celebrate the twenty five dollars that comes in. If I know that you know it was a meaningful gift, right? You know, so I think I'm looking at all the ways those twenty five dollars comes in and it sustains that three million and it grows that three million or whatever anyone can do in real meaningful ways, because I think that was meaningful for Mackenzie Scott and it made sense. It may not be for everybody, but it does not mean that theater offensive is not a place where you can bring your time, you know, or your talents or whatever, because that's all the things that we need to kind of sustain and grow the organization. Thank you. And thank you for talking about benefits and salary because dear black people, dear all people, actually, we got to start talking about salary and benefits and vacation and rest all of this is part of equity so these are not things that we should be shaming or backing off from talking about because it's not a bad way to spend your money um, on staff in any way um catherine you are a hero in boston um i hope you i know we had a joke at another panel about about your tall, fabulous energy. But um, also like you are here, like the, the community, the arts creative community here loves you so much and the work you do with BAMS Fest, creating that space, holding that space and at the museum, quite frankly, like programming around us. Um, how has, I mean, everything has changed. So I don't want to say how has things changed because everything's changed, and you know, with the pandemic and and you know, just everything. But I know Bams Fest right now is in the middle of virtual pre presentations. So I wanted to give some room to talk about what's happening with Bams Fest right now and the future of Bams Fest and why it's so important, especially in the festival landscape, which are very much like white in. In, in Boston, um, and in, really in everywhere, but especially in Boston. Um, can you talk about like the future of BAMS Fest and just let people know how they can tune in to the performances right now? Sure, thank you. I appreciate you. I love everyone on the on this panel. Y'all give me just innovation and vibration. Um, so so BAMS Fest, uh, when COVID hit, uh, we, obviously we had, to, we had to postpone, I won't say cancel, we had to postpone our festival. Um, our, our team was going through a lot, you know, that just everyone was dealing with their own stuff. And the decision um, was to, to pivot, really, um, which I feel like all Black people do all the time. We're firefighters. We, we put out fires every single day. Um, but what I didn't want to lose was all the time and energy and, and sweat equity put into finding the lineup. I didn't want to lose them. I did not, not want to honor our commitment set to still promoting them in a way that would amplify, no pun intended, their, their work, their creative talent, you know, their ability to change the identity of Boston's culture and narrative um, uh, through, a, through a, a digital platform. And then we're looking at like, what, what could this thing mean um, in a digital space? Because I knew Folks would be screen fatigued, folks are tired, they wanna go out, they're tired, I'm, I get it. But what I did not wanna lose out on was the fact of making space even in, even in a digital platform. And so Amplify the Soul is really about centering black joy and, and magnifying the importance and significance of black music, art and culture, particularly coming from a city like Boston, <laughs> particularly. And, um, you know, at the height of it, things like to Harold's point, every, everyone's money, everything just stopped. And we were approached. We didn't have to go seek it anymore. We were approached by a handful of folks, handful of white institutions about um, partnering on this digital idea that we had. And what that did was it created an opportunity for black and brown artists to rebuild their stamina, their confidence, um, to create, to recreate a world for themselves of what it feels like to be on a stage and pour their heart out, even if it's through a camera. And what I what we started to notice was a level of confidence that started to shift because um, we were one of the few organizations still employing 
and hiring Black artists, still giving them a platform, finding the resources to do it, and now take their brand from local to global digitally, which was like unheard of, <laughs> literally. Like we are already uh, six performances in collectively over 20, over 25,000 views so far. And we're at the halfway mark, <laughs> right? Um, never in my wildest dreams would I imagine that, but I, I knew that if we didn't continue our mission of breaking down barriers, even in a virtual space, we, we wouldn't have walked our talk and I'm all about walking my talk. So our series um, debuted June 11th. It continues through August 13th. We release a performance every Friday at eight o'clock on our YouTube channel, 11 amazing black and brown people showcasing the variety of what black music is. It's not just two things, it's multiple things. And also having conversation with those artists about their experiences doing these pre-recorded performances in times of COVID. It was not an easy task, believe me, <laughs> it was not. Um, as for the future of the organization, you know, for most people, if they don't, they probably don't know this, but Bands Fest, we're all volunteers. So I do this for free. I do it because I love my community. And I know for some people, it's like, you're crazy. I'm like, eventually I'll get there. My goal uh, with this organization is that there are going to be future generations who will lead this to its next iteration. And I'm just planting seeds constantly, helping to build up you know, black and brown artists, not just professionally, but personally, they had their human beings first before they chose their medium. So building that rapport is very, very important to me every single day um, because it helps, it helps me think about what are the opportunities that they would never get on their own that they can do through this platform. And because of, because of that commitment, um, our goal for the next three years is to build a platform called BAMS University which is a two-pronged approach to um, Black artists and curator development in the city of Boston. One from the perspective of building your business as an artist, centered on the Black and lived experience because oftentimes there are social and cultural conditions and needs that are never talked about that are kind of blanketed for every artist. But layering the fact that when you are a Black or Brown artist, it's hard to get approved for a loan. We know about you know, the financial system. We know about the housing system, right? Certain venues, um, um, white male promoters will only pick certain artists, right? Like there's all these different things. But part of it is that a lot of, a lot of curators, a lot of um, black and brown artists really struggle with the business side of it from, a, from the perspective of racial equity, spatial justice, economic empowerment. So we wanna make sure that we are preparing current and future generations to be, to be able to stand their own two feet and, and to um, the Kiba's point, to your point, and they have people bend to them, not them go you know, beg to others. Um, the other part of that, that initiative is also a, a um, performance intensive. And the reason why I want to focus on that is because we wanted to give a lot of different artists the opportunity to showcase and perform in a variety of different venues across the six New England states because oftentimes what has happened is we only have so many venues in the city of Boston and that kind of stifles um, the, the uh, psyche of artists about what they deserve to have. They either go from zero to a hundred and then they never gradually build that stamina to actually get to a stadium size. So they, they, they'll look foul and I just refuse for people to misrepresent Boston. So our goal is to uh, build relationships with venues across all New England states and take these a handful of artists on a journey to build their portfolio about the kinds of venues and spaces and to different audiences they can perform in front of or showcase the work. Thank you so much. I put the BAMS Fest link in the Q&A window for the audience. Um, Harold, you should drop in TTO as well. Um, Che, you should probably drop in something about black out walls and just is everybody, you know, plug their things. Um, we're also gonna send a recording out. So there'll be links in that recording to everyone who attended today. As you all know, I am 
Boston Globe culture columnist and creator of A Beautiful Resistance, celebrating Black joy and Black lives. When we um, were talking about events we wanted to have, and I, I came up with these community conversations uh, a couple months ago, and I chose each of you because uh, my interactions with you have inspired me, has moved me, has poured a little in my cup. And I just appreciate the multitudes of you. You've given me joy. And I would love for us to close out um, celebrating the multitudes of the melanin and our beauty and our magic and our brilliance in the way that we will not bend for others with having each of you say um, what gives you joy in this moment today. And you know, go ahead and walk that talk cat. <laughs> um. I'm sorry, repeat your question because I get lost to all up in your <laughs> your comments. In my chaos, um, yeah. what joy? What brings me joy? What gives me joy? Um, seeing um, black and brown people fully and holistically tap into their intelligence, their emotion, and their vision of themselves. Che. Um, earlier today, a friend of mine said a quote that was, I'm planting seeds for trees I'll never climb. And that's been stuck in my head all morning. And when Catherine was talking, it got back to me. So what brings me joy is um, being surrounded by people who I know are doing amazing things that hopefully Know, my kids, 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 kids. Well, be able to look back on and be excited about. I don't have any kids right now. In case you're wondering that, I'm just saying. Hopefully, I have kids who have kids who have kids. Just in case anybody was listening. <laughs> Makiba. Yeah. Um. I was walking through the museum this morning around 10:30, and um, I walked through an exhibition that's getting installed right now, and it's Equa Homes. Um exhibition I put the link in the chat and um, she was there watching the designers and the hangers and the lifts was there and the, the absolute radiance on her face and her smile um, brought me so much joy because she is such an incredible um, artist who has been doing this work um, and is from a block from where I'm from and um, is just gorgeous in all sorts of ways. And to have her at the center of this museum, so that when you walk through, you will see her stories there um, and your own stories um, is what brings me joy. I love that. Harold, live from the Inkwell, giving us joy. Live from the <laughs> Inkwell, chilling with Martha, looking for Oprah. I think what gives me joy is like the Black Sonic, you know, expression, right? Um, so whether that's celebrating with BAMFest and the wonderful kind of Black music or colloquialisms, but I just think when we are able to have an audible um, expression, um, Southern tongue, like just, it's just a reminder of the vastness of Blackness um, and the uniqueness of it. So that's what's bringing me joy. Like I said, all of you have given me joy today. I wanna to thank everyone for being here with us today. And I'm gonna close with a quote from JFK, um, a speech he gave at Amherst on poetry and the artist and Frost. And uh, I think it's fitting because a lot of times we have these conversations and I think there's a certain set of people that are like, oh, they just talked a bunch of shit about all the things that are bad and blah, 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 blah. But it's more than that. So JFK's quote, if sometimes our great artists have been the most critical of our society, it is because their sensitivity and their concern for justice, which must motivate any true artist, makes him aware that our nation falls short of its highest potential. I see little of more importance to the future of our country and our civilization than full recognition of the place of the artist. Thank you all for being with us today. The recording will go out. Be well, share your joy, take your joy. Love you. <laughs> Thank you.